Dhamma greetings. My name is Rahula. I'm a student of Bhikkhu Chandana. And I just wanted to share a thank you before watching. And just to let you know that uh, Bhikkhu Chandana is a wandering monk. And he basically depends totally on donations for food, shelter, transport, and medicine. So if you find this video beneficial and it's fruitful in your life, uh, a dana or donation would be greatly, greatly appreciated. So enjoy. Living a, a life brings with it a lot of situations that make a person or place a person in the tough position of having to deal with a lot of responsibilities. I just said many words to kind of formulate my thoughts in, uh, in, a, in a presentable way. But what essentially is trying to say is that you're alone. To face so many different types of circumstances as a living being especially as a human being. For that, from ancient times, thinkers, seekers of truth, what in their time period, by their contemporaries, and those who were impressed by such individuals, called them called them wise called them teachers so we have fortunately been given different views different windows of perspective from different cultures, different societies, different time periods of how to deal with life situations. So in different ways they were recorded. They were put in some form of writing or at least in the form of, shape of, stories, legends. Tales. Which throughout cultures, human cultures, you see them representing something, giving you what in modern parlance could be called a manual of how to deal with X, Y, Z difficulties and uh, challenges um, where you do not feel absolutely, completely alone in the void or where you have to face sometimes terrible situations. So we have been fortunate enough to have these guidebooks, manuals, records of how to be a better human being. As far back as we can go to documented history, even Sumerian times or, or Babylonian times, Egypt, India, Africa, China, So you have different ways where human beings, and obviously, you know, even older cultures, like the Aboriginal Australia, the Amazon, 
So different groups of human beings produced information, produced knowledge, because they themselves were observing. They were not just observing the stars. For their time period, with the level of uh, limited, rather, uh, resources that they had to tools that we consider to be, to be today to be technologically advanced, without any of those, they mapped out the stars in a much better way than we can now. What we're doing is just sorting out details, you know, getting a better shot of, let's say, Jupiter, things like that, you know. But when you look at history, as far as how people had access to information and wisdom, today we don't even hold a candle next to these previous cultures that have passed. Today we are dealing with a true pandemic, a true um, dissolution where all that knowledge from throughout the past history, from different cultures, all put together, this vast, vast resource is being undermined, ignored, depleted, bleached out. Where human beings are not able to have access to that way of tackling life, the challenges we meet. Now, what do I mean by dissolution? It's not just the written word that matters. It's how that written word is being kept alive, is being presented, is being promulgated, passed on. Information is best passed on in the form of somebody embodying it. That's why the ancients used to use a lot of imagery in stories. Lord Buddha describes it as, you know, there's this phrase that repeats again and again in different places, but in the specific context where it goes something like this, uh, after having explained uh, extensively a principle, a teaching, Lord Buddha would basically tap into the right brain, if you will, of the listener, which does the putting together of information in a stable, in, in a solid manner. And he uses similes. He uses analogies, metaphors. And that's where the brain goes ahead and just locks it on. But it wasn't just the story. The story has a powerful purpose and it does deliver. Yes, absolutely, that's what I'm trying to say. But the listener, the observer, must see it encapsulated, promulgated, explained, instructed, shown, manifested in the very example of the person speaking about it, speaking on it, basically exemplifying it. For that, we had those wise individuals in the past. We had these individuals that in ancient cultures we would call them perhaps shamans, we would call them saints, we would call them basically the wise. Aside from that, they also came to embody this religiosity, this, this, this uh, presence of spirituality that is pure through and through, that is authentic, that is reflective of the essence of life, the mystery of the universe, however you want to use, uh, you know, whatever type of sentence or phrase 
would get you to that aspect of the supramundane versus the mundane. So those ended up being referred to as the sacred texts or the sacred tradition or the elders, quote unquote. We do have today the digital forms of these, you know, this data, this information that has been carried over throughout the centuries and brought in. But again, the human being is going to resonate with a person who is living these truths. Now, something else has to be said about the symbolism. I mentioned the metaphors, the usage of similes and analogies, etc. Symbolism or symbols were also used. It was a very fast way of conveying something that was far more detail-oriented, far more descriptive than just a few words. So you have different symbolisms, different types of uh, things that were then used in buildings, in, 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 in uh, structures. The structure itself might have been a symbol. The positioning of that structure in a certain um, area, geographical, topographical area, that also became representative of something that no words could fully describe. But these are simply tools, just like the story is simply a tool. The teachings, in the context of Buddhism, for example, the teachings of Lord Buddha, the discourses, the suttas, they themselves are simply a tool, just a tool, that could or could not be used. Could not, as in, when people refuse to use it. Otherwise, it's absolutely use, usable. It changes, it's transformative. But what happens when no one's using it? That's what I mean by, by not usable, not applied. If you have a principle that you do not apply, a formulaic structure, a calculation, if you use that equation, you'll be able to figure out how to build this thing. But if you're not using that equation, no matter what you do, you can bang your head against the wall forever, it will not be constructed properly. It will fall, it will, dis you know, be brought down because it's standing on shaky ground. And that's what we have here today. Humanity that is standing on shaky ground. Why? Because all we have are symbols of the past, which by the way, in the hands of the, how should I say it, morons, in the hands of sociopaths, psychopaths, who are in positions of almost absolute power who claim to be things that they're not. And this includes religious individuals, so-called religious, in, individuals who are in religious positions in various levels of hierarchies, not just in Buddhism, but of course, in Buddhism, we have tons and tons and tons of that. Where you have just the appearance of a tradition. And for all intents and purposes, yeah, sure, they could even, you know, historically can, can, can trace it. As far as the lineage being unbroken. But that's just the surface There isn't the practice of it, the application of it. So the symbolism is, when not applied, even though the symbol is there, you need someone who reads that symbol. And that symbol's explanation cannot be conveyed in words. It's a living experience. That's why the symbol used to be something transformative before it turned into a symbol, before it turned into a simile, before it turned into an analogy, a metaphor, a way of expression. That's what it is. 
What you have today are people who are worshipping the symbol and thinking that they got it. They have now embodied, embodied within themselves the symbol, simply because they're wearing it, they're worshipping it, they're bowing to it, they're going through the motions, and they think they now are it. They are genuinely practicing it. They are carrying the legacy, their the torch of the past, however you want to see it. Look at it. What it is then, therefore, it is just fraud, plain and simple. Because when ancient seers, they're called seers. In India, they used to be called rishis. They were there before Lord Buddha. Um, Siddhartha Gautama came to the scene. They were there. It's, it's been, it had been there for over at least a thousand or so years. But not just in India, around the world. Because if you are a living human being, if you have eyes, if you have the six senses, if you have a brain that works, and you're inquisitive, if you're curious about life, and you're seeing suffering happen, if you're seeing the challenges that life presents, the responsibilities you have to bear, you start asking questions. Of course, not everyone was going to do that. Those individuals who really spent the time, sleepless nights, trying to understand, trying to go deep into them, their hearts, into their lives, asking why, what is this? Of course, we have, to my understanding, the perfect example in Lord Buddha, who attained Buddhahood by penetrating the deepest aspects of the mind. And then he formulated, if you will, the symbolism, which now I'm using it as a, as a placeholder for the thousands of discourses he gave and the thousands upon thousands of similes he offered in explaining the Dhamma so that people could also, again, continue experiencing it throughout the centuries no matter what. So that's why they were codified. The teachings were there in plain sight. They're there if you just could, instead of just repeating it, Start applying it. But when people who are the custodians, people, people who are supposed to practice it, don't, but only appear to be, bear the name of somebody who is supposed to be practicing, goes through the motions. This, is, this would be a case of like, where it's the opposite of what um, many times it's, it's, it's a reference to, such as, you know, the one that goes in English, you know, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, it better be, it probably is a duck. In this case, it's not a duck. Why? Because we have to be very honest and scrutinizing in our looking at the duck. If some teacher is saying some things that don't match, their behavior is not matching what they're purporting themselves to be all about. Well, there goes that duckness. <laughs> it's not there. So let me look at another aspect. Maybe I am using uh, the wrong way of looking at things. Maybe I'm coming from a biased position, etc., etc. But this is not about, what I want to address here is the cognitive dissonance of the person, the human being on this planet today. The cognitive dissonance. It's a, it's a term that we have in psychology. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that we look at when we're diagnosing patients. Um, you need to look at the integrity of the cognitive abilities of the person. What we also term as sanity, basically. 
it's not necessarily a psychosis, which is like a breakdown. There's a schism. There's a separation of reality. But what this leads to it could be a psychosis. Eventually, it could lead to that. Why? The person is genuinely trying to understand reality. Let's say the common person, the individual, in the context of religious or uh, spiritual atmosphere, this would be the person who is the aspirant, the person who is seeking, aspiring to live a noble, holy, spiritually focused, good life where they are practicing wholesome conduct. They're not harming anyone. They want to be happy and they want to make sure others are happy as well. They want to have a healthy, clean, beautiful environment. So they're coming from a genuine place. They want something good to happen. This is a good person. Now, remember what I said about the spiritual in, uh, guides or teachers, etc. that are supposed to be there. In other words, those who are trying to be the caretakers, the stewards, the guardians of that tradition. This doesn't necessarily only have to be with spiritual in that arena. It could be a professor at a university teaching philosophy, teaching humanities, any subject on the humanities. Are they truly holding true to teaching the student how to think, not what to think. Today it's completely convoluted in universities because there's so much money being poured in, so much special interest pouring in, and not many uh, of the old generation of professors are left. So what you have is a lot of younger professors who don't know their front from the back, who don't know much about life, teaching individuals, teaching new generations from their biased perspectives, imposing their opinions on the students, who, by the way, came from the educational system of the last 30, 40 years, or 20 years. And they want to change the world. They want to change the future. The same thing is happening in the political scene. The same thing is happening in the social uh, circuit where individuals, human beings, are facing individuals that are not living according to what their positions are all about, the positions they occupy. Whether it's a political person, all the way to a king or a, pre a president or a prime minister or a governor or a judge or a local politician, a mayor, all the way, every single position that pretty much society is supposed to be governed by. Same thing goes to media, um, individuals who are in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the business of influencing minds. So on one hand you had, I started with the religious uh, leaders or spiritually, you know, whatever. You, gurus also could fit. People who are claiming to be speaking about the, on the, you know, the other side of life, meaning spirituality and things like that. Reading their books and things, you know. New age characters showing up left and right that try to, you know, uh, make a fortune. And they have been making fortune left and right in the name of spirituality. Meanwhile, their lives aren't, aren't, they have nothing to do with that. It's about money, it's about gaining. That is not the truth that the ancients followed. You look at a politician who is supposed to be there for the sake of the public. At least that's what they claim. You know, they, these are words that come out of their, mo in their mouths when they get up in front of a group of people. It could be in the millions, it could be in the, you know, double digits. And they stand up and they keep making promises. Media outlets, 
newspaper, uh, you know, or, or TV anchors. People in the position of influencing others. A journalist. A reporter. On the news, let's say. Getting up in front of a camera. Speaking to the listener, speaking to the viewer, the audience. And lying through their teeth. While the viewer, while the audience, man, while the listener themselves were witness to the same event or are seeing the event take place right there on live TV, while the reporter is reporting something opposite to what is being displayed on camera. They are reinterpreting, in other words, programming what the viewer is not seeing but is supposed to see. This is at the crux, this is at the foundation of cognitive dissonance. That's why humanity, I say again and again, is being manipulated by experts at human psychology. This is something they have been perfecting for several, several decades how to manipulate people. This is not what the ancients were trying to do. This is the opposite of what they were trying to do. The human being was lifted out of ignorance thanks to the ancient thinkers in different cultures, they were removing the layers and layers of dust and ignorance from the minds of people. To take you from a state of ignorance, from the state of being a savage, from a state of being uncaring towards your fellow human being, towards the environment, to have respect of everything within you and outside of you, because you cannot have one and not the other. It's not a matter of either or, but that's what it has come to. So this diabolical, if you will, attitude that they have been, this agenda that they have been imposing, and now on a global scale. Human beings have never been in such a deep mess, I think, as they are now. Because there is no support coming to the average human, ordinary human being. Ordinary, who basically doesn't have any vested interest in any of these categories I mentioned. In politics, in legal uh, positions where they can get, you know, kickbacks, benefits, financial support, you know, gain. Um, they don't have any, let's say, interest in attaining any position in, uh, in the religious hierarchies, let's say being part of like a Buddhist monastic hierarchy in some wealthy country that is, you know, very supportive financially, etc., to monastics and whatnot. Uh, same goes for uh, people in the media, you know, and corporations. So the average person who doesn't have any interest in any of those, they're just trying to make ends meet who are really struggling, who is basically the audience of that fake reporting that's going on, the indoctrination that's going on through the movies they watch, through the shows they watch, the games that the kids are playing, the things, the indoctrination is taking place at school for their children from pre-kindergarten, basically. That person is the one who's being exposed to cognitive dissonance, and that is terrible. Because a human being needs guidance. Not guidance to how to become a terrible human being, but how to avoid that. Because what is being pushed and flourished and encouraged to grow and be cultivated and developed within you are the three poisons that Lord Buddha describes in the heart of a human being. And those are passions, lust, greed, basically, um, hatred, anger, ill will, loathsomeness, 
hatred, and delusion or ignorance. What I can add to that is apathy, the opposite of empathy, indifference. So you have these, primarily these three poisons that are being, if you look around, that's what you see. Look at the shows, look at the movies, look at the stories, look at the reporting that's going on. You're being forced to choose between this is bad, that is good. Well, wait a minute. Let's look at the whole picture. You want me to immediately sell this person, this group of people, this, this society out. Because you want me to say that. If I don't say that, guess what? I'm going to end up in trouble because you're going to stick a label on me. Punish me. And that's, you know, that's intimidation. It's very much mafia-like. Today, governments, that's what they do. The bigger, more influential government says, I want you to a smaller government uh, or society. It says, I want you to do this. I want you to agree with me on this. Well, what if your data that you're providing is insufficient or it's biased? One-sided. And this other group, the smaller group, sees that clearly and says, excuse me, what about this? What about that? And you say, no, no, it's not important. I want you to be on the same page with me on this. Otherwise, there will be punishment to you. And that's what they do, these sanctions that people t keep talking about. People are, uh, people are suffering. So this is a big mafia job, <laughs> if you think of it. Based on violence, based on ignorance, essentially it's just ignorance. To keep people dumb, to keep people down, to keep people confused as to what is right from wrong. Truly, what is wrong? What is wrong is what is being shoved down our minds. What you're being told to think again and again and again. What you're told to believe Despite your better judgment, let's not forget what's been happening during the last three or four years. It's a joke to our ancestors to have to expose ourselves to this nonsense, this illogical, completely opposite to common sense. And now it's being exposed. Every, you're seeing people coming out of the woodwork. They're finally admitting the mishandling of information, the actual lying that's another thing. People refuse to use the word lying when that's what it is. When a person doesn't say the truth, when they are tweaking what is true, when they are sugarcoating something, when they are presenting a slightly different image of what is really happening, they are lying. They are deceiving, not mishandling the truth, not misrepresenting the truth, not, you know, making mistakes, definitely not misinforming. They are truly lying. That's what it is. Lying has never gone out of fashion. Even though they have been Lying about lying. How cunning people have become. That's why we're so far off the reservation, off the mark of what it is to live a virtuous life. Even in Greek, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the golden era of, of, of Greek philosophy, there was so much emphasis on virtue. Plato talked about this so much. Aristotle, obviously Socrates, and others. In order for you to not be considered a barbarian, to be considered somebody worth talking with or to, they needed to see the person somewhat evolved. And one of the best ways to show that you are evolved was to see some characteristics in you that would unmistakably be regarded as virtuous. We don't have that in politicians. We don't have that in, in I'm sad to say, even in religious individuals all across the board. 
Buddhists included. Again, we come back to the regular person. I'm going to call them civilian. <laughs> It's a very tough, difficult time period to be that person who's on the receiving end of all this campaign of lies on every front. Because in the past, you had corrupt politicians. You usually had them. All of them. Even I was mentioning about Greek culture, Grecian times, and you know, or even you know, in, in India, in, in China, in. Uh, definitely in Egypt, you have power. Remember those three poisons I mentioned? Greed, or lust, or passion, hatred, anger, resentment, bitterness, ill will, basically. That's the second poison. The third one is carelessness towards your fellow man. Apathy, inconsideration, or ignorance. These three are the real culprits within a person. So what, one of the worst things that happens to a culture is when you have individuals who have these three poisons running amok, running the show, where society is aggrandizing that, glorifying that, and you have a bunch of them running the show, you have world leaders. You look at NATO. What is that? You look at the EU. What is that? Most of them are not even elected. They're just placed there. World Economic Forum. People go. Leaders. World leaders go. Why, why are you going there? You should be taking care of your people. Elites coming together. And they decide what's going to happen to the population of this planet. You look at their lifestyles, lavish lifestyles, endless resources, untouchability, above the law, getting away with anything. How is the common person going to look at that and then look back at their lives, look at that and then look back at their lives and say, scratch their head, is like, uh, I don't know what's what. Because you are giving them, they are actually getting two different perspectives on reality. The person gets up and says, oh, I see this, the world is going to be this way, it's going to be much better. Meanwhile, this is one of those individuals who's running on the three poisons, who's corrupt to the teeth, and surrounded by other people from that elite club, not the rest of us, eight billion. Now the person is confused. What are they going to say? The child is seeing the president of the country or the prime minister doing atrocities. They're not, let's say, the whole world is right now screaming for a ceasefire in the Middle East. The whole world. People. And then you have governments. So-called Western, you know, <laughs> civilized so-called, I, I use that term very loosely. Saying, no, there shouldn't be a ceasefire. Meanwhile, children are dying. Women are dying. Hospitals are being obliterated. When you have people from both, let's say in the case of Palestinians and Israelis, you have people around the world, both of these cultures coming together, they're crying out together, please, let there be peace. Both Palestinians and Jews. No one's listening to them. What does the human being do? There you go, another cognitive dissonance. Meanwhile, they're being promised something. Empty promises. So that's what you are caught 
It's the same thing with a toxic relationship between a man and a woman, by the way. When the partner cheats, when the partner lies, it's not true in their behavior. But they come around and they say things to their partner, and then they say, I, I hate people who are cheaters. I hate people who just disrespect their loved one. I hate it. This is, I can't stand the so-and-so example. How could they do that to their partner? Now, the a partner who's listening to this, they go, wow, you know. And the next time they leave the room, they go somewhere. In their mind, they're so impressed. They're like, wow, you know, I, I, you know, my husband or my wife is so amazing because they don't subscribe to that idea of cheating is good. Meanwhile, they go and turn around. They see that that person, their partner right there, five minutes earlier saying that. Now they are engaging in the opposite. That creates cognitive dissonance. I used to see this in couples, in couples therapy, in relationships with people. That puts the person on the receiving end in a very precarious state. Now, though, however, we're looking at this and it's shocking. That's why I'm talking about this again and again, because it's so huge. This is a big deal. This is not happening to that culture, that person, that group of people over there, far away from me. There's no way that it could touch me or affect me. There's no such thing anymore. Whatever's happening to one corner of the world is definitely happening here. Not will happen, it is happening here. And the other source of confusion, cognitive dissonance, is coming from the spiritual angle, the religious arena where the person, that common person I mentioned, okay, they give up hope on the legal or judicial or the political scene, having something change with the world, at least they'll turn their gaze to the spiritual and somehow get some hope coming from that arena. But what they're seeing are individuals with no substance, just talk. They're not living the life of religion. They're not living the life of a spiritually uh, aware person. And that comes in basic, basic level with the foundation of ethics, with the foundation of someone who is truly practicing morality. And now people are really stunned when they see pedophilia in supposedly spiritually awake people. What is that? So you have to come up with a different explanation to what you saw. You saw that. You heard that. You saw this person that you respect, you love, and you think that they must be enlightened. They have to be. But your eyes, your ears have brought you information that is undeniably opposite that which you thought. What do you do? Cognitive dissonance. Again. This is what causes that schism to happen. So now you are completely uprooted from reality. You have to. Remember earlier I began to say how it takes responsibility to live life. You need to be grounded on something solid. So when values are being torn from you, what are you going to be rooting yourself upon? Anchored in? What? There's nothing. So what you are being presented with is hopelessness. That you are broken. That you are nothing. That's what a human being today, around the world, is being taught that they are. No more. And that's why they're also pushing for the AI. Okay? That's why they're pushing for transhumanism. That's why they're blatantly getting up at World Economic Forum and saying, well, human beings are hackable machines. We don't need most of humans. They're actually saying this on camera. People with degrees, people with huge following, people are, who get up on National Geographic and that I used to follow since I was a kid, saying this. But they have to present it not in such blunt ways. They have to use flowery language. They have to give you something, a bait, Oh, greener future, greener this, a healthier planet, better future, better future, better world, better, better, better for whom? 
That's, that should be the question. Better for whom? When they're talking about the reduction of population, how do you reduce population to bring it down to 1 billion, from 8 billion? Or even better, I think the number, better for them, uh, 500 million, the entire population of the planet. So how do you drop it down? We're above 8 billion now, by the way. So practically, you're talking about almost 8 billion people you're going to get rid of. Reduction, okay? Well, how do you do that? What do you do to get to that? But when you have a population who is extremely hopeless, is thinking that, you know, this is the end. So, yeah, I guess, I guess. So this whole promotion of war, they're infusing the subconscious mind of people in different ways, different themes. Where you are now agreeing to world Armageddon. People are, you know, Lord Buddha says, what that means is, mind is the forerunner of all states. It's the first. You need to have the mind be geared in a certain way, in a certain direction, and then everything else follows. So what you think, that's what you become. That system is there throughout the universe. Before the Buddha, in fact. The Buddha just described it, revealed it, discovered it. But it's, that's a principle of the universe. Whether there's Buddhism or not, that's a system that continues. They know this, so they are trying to have everybody think that, you know what, it's inevitable. Uh, yeah, there, World War III is going to happen. That's what they're pushing for. When you create war, then you have really a subservient society. You will give up your rights. You will not think about the positives. Because part of you is going to think, well, I guess we tried the positives. It didn't work, so I guess this has to be done. That's why people support wars. That's why you have all these false flags, false flag operations, they say. You create a terrible, terrible situation. You never tell the world that you're the one responsible. You always blame it on someone else. And usually, you know, there was a movie in the 90s when I was lame and I went and watched it. It was like, wow. It was an eye-opener. Um, I just watched it once and that was enough. This was like almost 30 years ago. Usual suspects. Usual. I've always wondered about that term. Usual suspect. And that's what they use. And you have the media to support it. You create information. You create evidence. It's not evidence. You just created something. The population that is not using, that has not been using common sense, is now hungrily looking at these media sources and saying, "Okay, feed me. Feed me information, and I will believe whatever you tell me. I will sign wherever you want me to." That is not the society that our ancestors have struggled so much to bring us out of dark ages. We are going, we are, we are there actually. We're on the cusp of dark ages again. Because who these individuals are claiming themselves to be as the guardians, as the protectors of humanity, these individuals, whether it's the spiritual arena or the non-spiritual the worldly, mundane, political, legal arenas. They're both in cahoots, as they say. And the victim is us. The person who is experiencing cognitive dissonance and completely lost. And what my thing is here, effort, is to say we're not lost. We are not lost. All you have to do is bring in the information of what you believe in your heart of hearts to be true and apply it in your life. Who cares if your neighbor is not practicing ethics, morality? Who cares if the people around you are not? That doesn't mean you need to stoop down to their level. Encourage them to have some color, 
the right colors to live by, of integrity, of genuine courage, of being curious about seeking the juiciness of life, not to become gray, and that's what they're doing. They're mixing things left and right, so what that does is it creates tremendous commotion. It creates confusion, perplexity, and war follows. That's why you have these whole massive so-called migrations. This is not migration. This is forced ejection of people from one place and infusion of them into cultures that are not ready to support such cultures. They're not meant for each other. It's like squeezing. Suddenly it's going to be a matter of throwing in a few wolves into a, a herd of sheep. What do you think the wolves are going to do? Behave like sheep now? Change? No, it's going to be chaos. It's going to be a lot of dead sheep. That's what they're doing. Clash of cultures, which creates confusion. And this is the arena of where psychopaths and sociopaths really feel like their goals are being met. And their goals are too uh, disgusting to even uh, you know, elaborate on. They're the opposite of good. They're the opposite of what is holy. They have lost their way, but they have resources. They are abusing the wonderful karmic merits that they have gained because of good actions they've committed in the past. Now they're born as human beings in these very prestigious elite positions that they've reached thanks to those good actions. But because they don't have wisdom, they simply follow their whims and those three poisons in their hearts. And they're going to find similar thinkers, similar ways of operators. And they're going to come and join together because of a lack in understanding of what's really happening. That they are suffering. That's what it is. The psychopath is suffering. Sociopath is suffering. The only way they gain some, and some level of a brief satisfaction is when they cause suffering to happen to others. When they create confusion, that partner that I said goes and cheats on their husband after lying to them, deceiving them, blatantly, they will get a kick. That risk factor, that not being caught factor, that fear of possibly the danger of being caught and not being caught while they're doing it gives them a sense of really convoluted uh, satisfaction. It's brief. Until it happens to them. And that's what it is. These people don't realize that their time is sooner or later going to run out. And they're not going to really be in that prestigious position of untouchability. They will be screaming and squealing like, unfortunately, like the image is not good, but it's, it's, it's shocking. But it, like, squealing like an animal that's being pulled in to be slaughtered, seeing their loved ones being slaughtered. When you develop in your practice, in meditation, in this Dhamma and discipline of Lord Buddha, when the meditator goes deep, there are states where you will come to see these realms. Okay? I'm mentioning this because over time, over the years, people have asked me, Bhante, how do you, what do you, you know, why do you say there are hell realms? Because they exist. I was a big, you know, I come from a scientific approach of looking at things, the repeatability, the whatever I'm saying needs to be somewhat validated by experience, etc. So this practice gives you the experience of what it is that Lord Buddha talked about. The hell realms are real and these individuals who have in my lifetime have died, these, you know, cabal, these these evil people that have been harming and planning these horrific things, not just from our time, but even before. Mm -hmm. 
they don't live forever, you know. At least they don't live in that capacity forever. This queen, this royal highness, this prime minister, this president, this general, this person who goes and becomes the author of the slaughter of so many people or causes the deaths of so many people, causes wars to occur, encourages such havoc, terror to fall upon people. They scream like animals in the slaughterhouse. Squeal today. But it's not a one-time thing. Within a minute, they will scream probably 365 times. I haven't counted, but it's, it's ongoing, non-stop, and it breaks your heart. That while they were alive, they had the opportunities, plural, to really change the world. Because they have so much wealthy merits, such beautiful merits of work that they have done. That's why they're in this very wealthy, rich, untouchable family, let's say. Being felt, fed with not just gold and platinum spoons, encrusted with diamonds and emeralds. They could do so much. Instead, they go down this road of debauchery, of taking things from others, stealing in broad daylight, and gaining some sense of satisfaction. You don't have to go down that road, and there's no need for you to be envying these characters. That's what I'm trying to say, because that's what they're pushing for. So symbolism is dead because symbolism, without you infusing it with life, it can easily be altered into something horrific. You look at Hitler. He used symbolism from the East, especially from Buddhism, misrepresented it. In his messed up way of thinking, He applied things, or actually brought in things, but his application of it was totally, wrongly, unwholesome, based. Against nature. So what we have is a system that is in place that goes against nature. The closest people who are practicing the ways of nature are the common folk. That's what I'm trying to say. And you have nothing to worry about. Please don't look at these religious individuals the politicians, the legal individuals, or anybody that you used to respect, don't respect them simply because of their titles, because of what others are saying. Anybody who is in that particularly important position for you need to bring peace of mind to you, not cognitive dissonance, not perplexity. You don't need a partner. You don't need a a mate in your life who constantly makes you live at the edge of your seat. You don't know what's to come in the next minute. That is not your lot. That is not why you're alive. You're here alive to feel love. You're here to be appreciated, to be cared for, to be enjoyed, and for others to give you love as you yourself give them love. This is the opposite of wanting or agreeing to there being an, a, a third war, war. This is the opposite of losing hope. Absolutely. And they don't like that. They don't want a humanity that really is creating something wonderful, something beautiful. That's why they even went and, and, and sullied the image of beauty, art, even the genders. Completely trying to confused children. Only a devious, incredibly foolish mind, psychopath, sociopath, do that. You don't have to be victims to that. 
there's a bright future for us. But you need to come back to you, to rely on you and the goodness in your heart. In spite of the fact that there are the three poisons that you have to battle with. You're battling your, the, the forces of these three poisons in you, not some enemy outside of you. That's the thing. Despite what the journalists are telling you, what the politicians are telling you, what they are reasoning for you to say yes to. No. No good has ever come out of war. I can attest to that. I was a victim of that for 17 years of my life. None of these politicians, none of these people who keep talking about war, yeah, 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 let's send our army. None of them have been shot at. None of them have received the bullets sent in their direction. None. These people who sign documents, these kings, these prime ministers, these presidents, these congressmen, these senators, who name it, these generals, none of them have actually been shot at. None of their loved ones have been shot at. I've been shot at with bombs. <laughs> and they landed. And I, by some means, landed in the hospital a few times. I wasn't supposed to make it, but I made it for some reason. So before you go ahead and agree to send your child, your, your loved ones to war and say, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this at, without having any knowledge of what's really happening on the ground. Truly what's happening and what has been happening. Before you do that, make sure you put yourself there, you go there, you face, you taste what is happening. How it feels to get shot with an RPG, with a bomb, with a rocket, mortar that's, a, that's thrown into your house and it blows up and all the shrapnel come and hit your loved ones and you. You lose body parts and you see blood rushing out of your arteries. You're taken to the, if you're taken, to the ER. I was refused admittance at an ER. I was bleeding profusely. I was only eight. My parents didn't have a car. The neighbors had a car. They shoved me into, I'm bleeding from my head and my toes, which were now missing. <laughs> they didn't allow us in, even though they saw me. They closed the gates of the, of the hospital. And there was, it wasn't like all hell had broken loose in that part of Beirut. This was happening there, by the way. So they had to drive now, high speed. I could still feel the wind. The windows, they had rolled down the windows. They didn't have automatic windows. And they rushed me to this other hospital, and all of a sudden there was this just group of doctors and the nurses and they just jumped. I still remember it was like turquoise blue scrubs that they had on. My dad was left outside. I was begging them to see my dad. It's heart-wrenching when I see these people talking about war. They have no clue what it tastes like, no clue what they're saying. None of them have been shot by a bullet, let alone a rocket, let alone a rocket that's thrown by this cowardly pilot somewhere, or this drone pilot who drops this bomb and obliterates a building full of people. How am I going to justify that action? How long am I going to put up with this lie that, well, they were bad people? How long? I guarantee at the moment of your death, you will remember that action. And you will remember the support you gave to such an action. 
I say this and I wanted to speak on this to this extent because I've been seeing a lot of so-called well-educated people, influential people, people with many, many, many followers, many, many degrees, such an influence, talking so openly, unashamedly, unabashedly, on, yeah, there should be war, there should not be a ceasefire. Do you understand what you're saying? How about if you were on the receiving end of that war that you are promoting? What if your child was left there on the other side? Hmm? Would you still be so adamantly supporting the killing of people? Animals don't do this. What we've been doing to each other. Our ancestors are really ashamed of us. Is this what we, we, we bought you and, and, you know, all this knowledge for? But we don't have to take this road. You don't have to look outside of you. You keep looking outside of you, you're going to get that cognitive dissonance. So protect yourself. Protect from the stories that you are carrying inwardly into your mind and repeating to yourself. You can help the situation by simply saying, what if it was me? What if it was my daughter? What if it was my children? What if it was my mother on the other side of this fence that I'm saying, we need to bring hell to these people or to this, or we need to... Would my attitude change? Just presenting that question says so much. It changes the whole atmosphere. So, yeah.